And as they went to 500,000, 1 million, 1.5 million, and breach, I think they themselves were surprised. So that's the absolute atom bomb shocker. Neil De Beer has actually described Jacob Zuma's performance in the last elections in South Africa as a coming back of an atomic bomb. Let's understand why he thinks that Jacob Zuma can be described as an atomic bomb, and I'll be back for some really interesting analysis on Jacob Zuma in prison in Robben Island. I think there are two shocks, two surprises. Not the entry of MK, but the atom bomb of MK. I, I think all of us knew 8%, 9%, 10 to the max. No, 15%. When that, in actual fact, they sat just across me, the whole array of the MK <clears throat> staff and admin. And as they went to 500,000, 1 million, 1.5 million, and breach, I think they themselves were surprised. So that's the absolute atom bomb shocker. And then the one that disappointed the most, I'm sorry, must tell you, is Ryzen Zanzi. Absolute, absolute shocker of a result. So yin and yang, um, and, and those are the two. The other one I think we all knew, uh, about the ANC, that the ANC would not get 50 plus one. We were wandering between 40 and 50. That is what we were discussing. I said um, they would be lucky to get 45. Uh, they got less. So an absolute uh, desecration of the ANC. And the EFF now being outwitted by the, um, by the MK party. I don't think they are happy, but... That is the result, I think, in a cumulative. Now that the result is there, I think no matter what will happen, it will be called today. Yeah, so what do you guys think? Many people do not understand how Jacob Zuma was able to, you know, grab a large share of the constituency of the electorate in such a short time. It's really difficult for a lot of people to understand, both South Africans and non-South Africans. What was the reason for this? Many people have said that he's, he was, a, you know, a populist, the original populist, who speaks with less academic language and less grammar and really down-to-earth man of the people. Others think that there's something else. But I found this really interesting research on The Spectator that actually described the character and the personality and the drive and the, you know, the charisma of Jacob Zuma and his appeal to the people of South Africa. And I think this gives a sort of like a kind of like a picture as we begin to understand what might have impacted or influenced Jacob Zuma's rise in power within this short comeback he had in South Africa's politics. So the research says that for a decade to 1973, Jay-Z, or Jacob Zuma as he's popularly known, was an inmate in Robben Island, the infamous prison built on 1,300-acre slab of rock four miles off the South African coast. A fellow inmate was, Jacob Zuma, uh, was Nelson Mandela, of course, also inside for treason. Both of them went to become South Africa's president. But whereas Mandela had the Robben Island prison shut down and turned into a national monument, Jacob Zuma, who has once again set his slights on high office, now wants it reopened. In 2018, Jacob Zuma was, forced from, was removed from office by the ruling African National Congress, accused of theft and embezzlement. It is bizarre that he has now made a return to politics in the run-up to the May presidential election. But so far, his brand of patriotic populism has once more proved appealing. This is exactly what I mean. That, you know, it's like, you know, Jacob Zuma has a... His, his style of populism might need to be studied by populist researchers because he has a way of, uh, you know, getting his populism really down to the earth or probably he understands the South African people. I don't know. But let's keep on going. So it says that the new inmates of Robben Island in Jacob Zuma's vision of the future will be mothers and babies. That's strange. In 2023, an estimated 80,000 underage girls, mostly black, became pregnant. Many dropped out of school as a result. So Zuma's plan is to build a university on the island where these young girls can complete their studies. He has not explained how so many people 
along with the teachers and other staff, can be accommodated on such a small piece of island. His other big idea for education, so it's, it's really interesting. So it's beginning to become clear, you know, how the kind of ideas Jacob Zuma has might really feel a little bit like something that is out of <laughs> out of what the expectations of of the populace might be, but then appealing in a way to the poor, to the masses, and generally. So, like Robben Island, for example, and this is how Zuma thinks. Robben Island has been a prison that has been known, you know, to um, that that actually has been known, especially with Nelson Mandela, but he himself and other prominent figures during the fight for against apartheid, and um, having that memory uh, politics attached to that space, Robben Island. He now wants to make it a school for underage girls who have gotten pregnant and and all of that. You see that kind of idea. I think it's kind of like the kind of ideas he throws out to the people and gets them thinking and wondering what kind of man is this. It's kind of like a demagoguery in that instance, uh, sort of like what what uh, uh, would have been called um, a messianic personality by really making this really strange assumptions and ideas around some fixated notions around certain spaces. And this has kind of, kind of like, I suspect, is Jacob Zuma's strategy of really making people really wonder what kind of man is this, and then they really want to push to believe that, you know, this is our savior, he has a messianic complex, and that that's the way to go. But anyway, the research further argues that his other big idea for education is to bring back canning for errant school children. Caning, caning, that's flogging with, with um, sticks. Uh, you know, with caning anyway for errant school children, especially those who play truant. True corporal punishment, though corporal punishment has been banned since 1997, Jacob Zuma isn't wrong to think it a popular proposal. So in 2022, a survey by Afro Baram Barometer, a respected polling firm, showed that a majority of South Africans believe that it's okay for naughty kids to get a whack. So if you remember the... It's really interesting because, you know, in the Nordics where I stay here, um, you know, I think caning had been banned for a long time, and uh, especially in the West anyway, you don't get to just whack children like as it is in... It has been in tradi growing up in traditional uh, Nigerian society. That was kind of like commonplace. And uh, children really understood that if they messed up, they got whacked. And here it says that Jacob Zuma, that's kind of like the thinking. So he wants to bring that back. And that's going to be like his own perspective to enforce discipline and kind of like rebuild a society from the decadence that actually has heralded South African society. I, I, I mean, like, I'm now getting into his thought processes and his ideas and what he's been really um, feeding to the people, you know. The, it's kind of like his strategy for populism. Really interesting. The research also speaks about how um, it says that if you remember the TV series House of Cards with the fictional British Prime Minister Francis Ukwart, you recall his shock move to bring back national service. Now, Jacob Zuma also wants that too. Jacob Zuma says that there will be no gap year. Going to a military camp will teach young men to be responsible citizens. It will also give them discipline and important life lessons. I know that... Um, Patriotic Alliance Gaton McKenzie also speaks about how rather than giving the young people in South Africa their 300 rand Sasa grants, he'd rather, um, you know, recruit them in the military or even recruit them um, as officers who check for uh, passports of Im illegal immigrants, you see, and in that way help to promote his uh, policies to deport illegal immigrants from South Africa. So here this research says that Jacob Zuma wants to bring back national service and make people go back, you know, they have to serve the country in a way by bringing back discipline, sending them to that kind of like military camp and teach them to be responsible citizens and all that. So the research says that some say that in a country with the world's third highest murder rate, teaching youngsters to use machine guns might not be the best idea. However, in 1975, having been released from Robben Island, Zuma headed the intelligence branch of the ANC military wing, Unkonto Wesizwe, or MK, the spare of the nation. In December last year, Zuma revived the MK, this time not as a guerrilla unit or movement, but as a political party. The ANC has gone to court, claiming they own the brand, 
but the ANC is not on the front foot. A few weeks ago, a national poll showed that its support had dipped to 39%. The opposition Democratic Alliance is just 11 points behind, and from nowhere, Zuma's MK has picked up 13%, making it the third largest party in South Africa. That's really shocking. So it has overtaken the EFF. I think the EFF stood at um, 9%. It actually dropped from 10% to 9%. Why Zuma is now at a, st at a stunning 13%. MK party. Really, really, really interesting. So it also says that Zuma's bid for power isn't even technically legal. The constitution allows a president to serve no more than two terms, and Zuma has done that from 2009 to 2018. But even so, his party has fielded him as its candidate and threatened violence if his name does not appear on the ballot box. So it says that if it seems odd for people to support someone facing multiple charges for embezzlement and who's already served two presidential terms, Remember that South Africa remains a deeply conservative society. Okay? Black men are expected to pay a bright price to the father of their fiancé, and women do most of the child raising. It is not unusual for young stars to stand when grandparents enter the room, and men and women do not talk about sex in polite, so, so, uh, do not talk about sex in polite society. In Africans, among the most widely spoken languages across, across all races, it would be unthinkable to address an older person by name rather than respectively using uncle or auntie. The ruling party is the ANC party is full of lawyers and intellectuals, but Zuma, who had little schooling, appeals to the masses as someone who has walked in their shoes, a cattle herder from a poor Zulu family, one of the millions struggling to get by while the black and white elite turn a deaf ear to their plight. So these are kind of like the mechanisms by which he, his attractiveness to the people of South Africa actually has been growing because he presents himself as this kind of like uh, one of us kind of thing, a poor Zulu cattle herd, herder, you know, that's actually been ignored by the elites in South Africa, both black and white. So the research further says that a quarter of all South Africans live in a tiny in the tiny Gauteng province, 1.5% of the country's total land area, and that includes the country's largest city, Johannesburg, and, cap and the capital, Pretoria. Zuma proposes a system of decentralization with incentives for factories to be set up in the towns and villages so that people can work close to home. That's kind of like a uh, really populist idea. Some portray Zuma as an un uneducated Yob, but he is far more complex than that. On Robben Island, inmates would unburden themselves to him, knowing he would never break a confidence. To while away time, he introduced the inmates and some of the guards to chess, a game he still enjoys. Although he has a history of corruption, but in South Africa, that's par for this co for the course. In 2020, five hundred and eighty thousand dollars in banknotes were found hidden in a sofa on President Cyril Ramaphosa's farm. That's the popular Fala Fala case, uh, gate, or, you know, the popular Fala Fala case. And this farm is located 120 miles north of Johannesburg. As they had done with Zuma, the ANC used its numbers in parliament to stop the debate on the matter. And when its own list of candidates were leaked secretly, it's read like a who's who of those named in the seemingly endless scandals. So it says that South Africa has been a republic since 1961, yet within its borders, several kingdoms remain in play. None more powerful than that of the Zulus, the warrior nation accounting for a fifth of the population. So this makes sense. So when Jacob Zuma speaks, he's speaking to one-fifth of the population. And if he's able to convince that one-fifth of the population, that's a really critical mass, a force um, within the electorate you know, to, to really push for power. So it also says that um, for the Zulus, uh, the Zulu was a war, warrior nation accounting for a fifth of the population who in 1879 defeated the might of the British Empire in the popular battle of Isandlawana. In the past three years anyway, the Zulu king, Goodwill Zwelitini, Zwelitini and his prime minister, Prince Mangosutu Butelezi, 
Legends on the popular landscape for more than half of a century both died of old age, leaving a void in the heart of the tribe, of the Zulu tribe. So Zip Zuma is ready to fill that void. He once drew the, Zuma, the Zulu vote to the ANC, but now it could form the backbone for his new MK. After more than 400 years of European influence, during which various parts of the country have been ruled by France, Britain, and the Netherlands, and used by Portugal and Germany as a supply base, South Africa has a complex legal system known as the Roman Dutch law. Jacob Zuma wants to replace that with what he calls the African law. Across much of the continent, homosexual acts are banned, and Uganda has proposed a death penalty. Also with Ghana, Ghana has a really interesting tweet to his own anti-LGBT bill. But South Africa legalized same-sex same marriage in 2006. Seven years ahead of Britain at the time, Zuma described the idea as a disgrace to the nation and to God. And in February, a rally of MK supporters cheered when he said, Who made the law that a man can date another man? The question was rhetorical, but the answer is that Nelson Mandela made the law and it was approved by the ANC. In London, human rights advocate Peter Tatchell has accused Zuma of betraying Mandela's legacy of tolerance by pushing a populist agenda. These illiberal social policies will do nothing to address people's prime concerns, which are unemployment, poor housing, and the cost of living, he said. Adding to the steps to incriminate homosexuality would contravene the South African constitution. But the West's preoccupation with being socially liberal does not resonate in poorer parts of South Africa, right? There's a disconnect between the upper quintile who dominate the media, politics, business, and government and the millions who live in one-room shacks and go to bed hungry. The media focuses on stories about climate change and what pronouns we should use. They frequently cite Donald Trump as a threat to democracy and worry about the plight of Gazan refugees without a thought for the thousands of people driven from their homes by Islamic militants in northern Mozambique, just two hours' flight from Johannesburg. So um, this, this is kind of like um, a summary of what Jacob Zuma's populism has, is, has uh, the character of his populism, in that he speaks about, you know, there are these interestingly interesting policies all over the place that might be resonating with the Zulu people, and he's using the Zulu people vote as kind of like a critical base to drive his support for the MK party. That's a really interesting strategy. But in this video, anyway, we've had a lot to talk about. I want you guys to share your comments. Why is he so attractive? What's making his comeback really potent? Share your thoughts in the comments.